Welcome to Real Talk of Real Business Pros Podcast, the podcast that empowers you to win at work, at home, and in life. Your host is Jonathan Loudermilk, a multiple best-selling author, CEO, and creator of Smart CRM. This show's mission is to bring you valuable insights, inspiration, and real-world strategies from the world's leading business minds. Get ready to start winning in every area of your life. Let's start the show. Welcome to another episode of Real Talk of Real Business Pros. It's your boy, Jonathan Laudermilk, your host with the most. And I've got a damn good guest on today. He's actually a good friend of mine. Um, I've watched him do some amazing things over the last couple of years in, in two different companies that he owns. So, you know, I had to have him on the podcast so we could share some of those gold nuggets with uh, y'all as well as myself, if I'm being honest. So with that being said, before I kick it over and we get the show started. If this is your first time tuning in, I just want you to kick back, relax, and enjoy the show. Your gift to us is that you're taking time out of your valuable day to invest in yourself listening to this podcast. However, if this is your second, your third, your fourth, your fifth, your umpteenth time, you know what I need you to do. I need you to like and subscribe. I need you to tag us on social media. Shoot, you can even send this directly uh, to a, a entrepreneur brother and sister in need that needs to hear this message today because it truly helps support the channel. Um, and that's what it's really about. We want to give back to our fellow brothers and sisters so that they can create a legacy worth leaving. So with that being said, I'm going to kick it off to our guest. Normally, I do the introductions, but you know, we're going we're gonna freestyle a little bit today. So lo and behold, welcome Travis Wells to the show. So grateful to have you here today, brother. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy day to hop on the show. Yeah, man. Thank you for having me on. I appreciate the hell out of you and everybody listening. So I'm Travis Wells. I own a few real estate companies, holding uh wholesale creative companies have over 70 doors. Well, I just sold one of my parks, so that might have went down a little bit. But I've uh, <laughs> been buying real estate for 13 years, been doing real estate for 20 years. Um, was top in the world in the oil and gas industry before I exited that into full-time entrepreneurship. So I am super excited to share my story here today and to be with y'all. That's awesome, man. So like, I think like my, the best place I like to start is what I like to call the origin story. This is like, what's your Batman or your Superman story of like, how did you become you essentially, Travis is kind of what we're looking for. So like, dude, however far back that is, was it when you were a kid? Was it something a little bit later in life? Like, what's that story? Yeah, man, I grew up working on a ranch, sun up to sun down. Learned a ton of work ethic there. Glad I did. Hated it then. <laughs> <laughs> Love it now. Um, you know, you end up tending to be able to outwork a lot of people when you grow up that way. It's just normal. Um, came up in the oil and gas industry. Did that for hell until last year. You know, started as a grunt. Had no college education. Got kicked out of college because I just didn't go. Graduated last, second to last in my high school. Ended up um, where I'm from. You know, everybody goes to the refineries. I didn't want to do that. Didn't want to see the same pavement every single day and do that. Nothing wrong with it. You know, they make a lot of money for what they do, but it just wasn't my thing. I wanted to see different sceneries. And anyways, it took me to oil and gas after some some contemplating. I did it for a year out in the drilling rigs, was doing construction on the side, got I'm going to just give the mediocre version of this. Had a horrible accident where I was uh, had a house fall on me. Uh, collapsed the left side of my body, moved my heart like a pole, moved my heart. I have half a, half a pectoral, broke my ribs, went into my lung, like just a whole. So, so that's how that happened? Yeah. Yeah. So I got half a chest. You know, I was uh, I was doing side work. I was doing oil and gas, but you're not always on a rig. Like you get off days. So on my off days, I was doing construction. I was like 20 years old. Yeah. So, you know, I was doing demolition. We were tearing down houses. And, uh, you know, I was 20 years old. So I came in from the night before, just, I wasn't drunk, but I just, you know, I was young, didn't have all my senses like you do now as you mature. And uh, I was kind of in the wrong place, the wrong time and house collapsed. I was there, you know, a pole flipped around, went through me, pinned me to a freaking garage. Holy my heart. Cow. Yeah. Didn't puncture it here. Right. How, how, how did it, hold on. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, dude. <laughs> I'm out, man. I'm throwing a flag on the field. How did it move your heart without killing you? So that's what I asked the doc while I was sitting there because, you know, when it happened, the, the it was like a pole. It was yeah. Like the square part of the brace from a pole. Like it came up, flipped around, and like just went through me. And I guess your heart's slippery, right? I'm not a doctor, but it, it didn't hit me. You know, it just kind of like moved it out of the way. So when it did, it, it hit my ribs and all the pressure broke them. And then when those broke, you know, your lungs right there. So it, it collapsed my lung and then I couldn't breathe. I was well, like, oh, so did it puncture you? Yeah, it punctured. It okay, punctured. so like it like impaled you. Yeah, it impaled. It went through my chest right here. I have a scar across right here. Yeah, well, I've seen the photos of like your yeah. fitness stuff, and we'll get into that. But like, but I never knew that a house like collapsed on you is like how that <laughs> Holy cow, man! Yeah. Dude, that's nothing short of the grace of God. Yeah. So you know, I I get up, I'm impaled. I tell everybody I'm pissed for some reason. I'm like, hey, come here. I think because I wanted them to like help me. You know, they're like. You know, and I'm like, hey, <laughs> this out. So we, we like had all these dudes like picking this pole up and, and they got it out of me, which was the doctor said it's like a horrible idea, but we did it. And then I just boom, collapsed, like not fainted, but just, you know, everything was broke. Yeah. You know? And I was like, damn, I was like, pick me up, take me to the freaking hospital. Like, what are y'all doing? And I had a hole and I had a blue jean jacket. I was like, give me my jacket. I like wrapped it around and like my my buddy took me i couldn't breathe you know so I, my mind i was like man i gotta like try to find these short gasps you know so i'm just like you know like just barely you know so anyway i made it there i remember asking the doc before i went out i don't know if they knocked me out if i just went out finally maybe adrenaline left i don't know but i remember i'm like how the hell am i here doc like my heart and he's like you just it just moved it you know and i was like done right so I, I wait I wake up, I'm stitched up, ugly ass. They had they did an ugly ass job because they were trying to save my life. Yeah. And uh, so when that happened, I just had a lot of dead tissue. So they just removed it all. Mm -hmm. So now I'm just like missing half that muscle. And uh yeah, it's a pretty gnarly story. So yeah, dude, that's that's insane, man. <laughs> yeah, for real. So like was there any like rehab or any like what would that look like the recovery side? Yeah, I think it was about six months to like really walk around yeah. again, you know. So like, uh, kind of kind of slowed me down. It was a good thing at the time. Well, you know, that 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 was gonna be my next question. Is like, dude, how did that impact you moving forward? Like that that's like a life altering experience. So like, so yeah. how did that impact you, and how did that change you? Yeah, dude, it kind of just slowed me down. Um, everybody's wired different. I'm just balls of the walls, whatever I do. So it kind of just like forced me to slow down and think a little bit. And, um, I was like, well, <laughs> you know, maybe I should do something a little different, <laughs> you know? So, uh, kind of, kind of matured me actually, uh, years really. I was like, well, I really don't want to go out and party and stuff and be doing all these jobs, try to keep a, you know, more centered being and, and mind and things like that. So that helped in, in that instance. Um, still stayed doing real estate stuff, but I didn't do the construction side of it. Uh, oil and gas ended up, um, ended up doing that a couple years later. I took off of that for a couple years and did some like assistant coaching at a school, you know, while I was getting myself back going and stuff. Yeah. And then I went back to the oil field and, uh, started out driving an 18 wheeler, ended up being their vice president of the company. Um, what's funny is, my main job, what I got known best top in every in the industry for doing was blowing stuff up. So I always like, I guess just keep gravitating towards that line of work. But um, you know, I was the guy that that wired all the explosives that we would send down on earth, you know, and then and then I was the engineer that was actually pulling the trigger, you know, and then I was the vice president of the company. And uh, man, did that for 13 years until last year. And then just, uh, you know, I had, I had a really free reign as a, as a corporate in corporate America as me opposed to being used to being like the worker all the time. And then in mm. corporate America, like it was, I'm like, damn, eight hours, like this is nothing. So I had a lot of side, side money, side income stuff coming in. And 
um, corporate America doesn't love that, right? <laughs> so they started tightening the leash, you know. That's and a nice like, way of putting it. Yeah. Yeah. And and I get it, right? We have companies, we get it. You got to have good employees. Understand uh, my mind. If I was doing my job, it didn't matter, but I didn't know the company. Anyways, I pieced out um, the, but the, there's a very interesting, and cut me off if you need to. Oh, go ahead, brother. There's a very interesting uh, pivot that that was like just an intervention that made me take the leap. Because you got to imagine being the vice president of one of the top oil and gas service companies in the world paid pretty decent. Yeah. And uh, um, so it was a really hard gig and I didn't have to work a lot, really. Like it was more of like a knowledge thing. Like it was, it was the go to. Well, well you, you earned it over 13 years of starting right. literally from the bottom, blowing up holes and <laughs> Yeah, Put it up to the top. So you earned that over thirteen years. Yeah, well, I'm at um. Uh, so I'm at uh, MDM, you know, oh Stuman's event. Um, mm -hmm. and and you know, one of my coaches now that's been a coach ever since pulls me in the back, and uh, I remember, uh, and he's like, "Hey, dude, I want to meet with you." Which we've been talking on Zooms and stuff like that, and I might have started coaching with him by then, but it might have been just then. But anyway, we had a meeting somehow. I don't remember how it even happened, but it was at that that event. And uh, we're talking. He's like, hey, look, like you're treating your W-2 job like like a Section 8 voucher. And I'm like, bro, like I'm getting paid a lot of money. It's an expensive ass Section 8 voucher. He's like, yeah, but like you're capable of more like like that hasn't crossed your mind. I'm like, well, yeah, I'm doing all this stuff on the side. He's like, well, what if you just focused? Right. Like, what do you, what do you need to focus? I was like money. Like we all need money to focus. He's like, cool. Like, well, what if I just invested? And I'm like, well, what do you, what does that look like? You know, like I've never asked for money from anyone. What does that look like? He's like, well, what do you need to make money in real estate? I was like, well, I need leads. And uh, he's like, cool. Like how much does that cost? I was like, I don't know. Like, a lot. He's like, cool. we got you. And I was like, really? He's like, yeah, but it's gotta be full time. Right. And, so, well, all right, cool, let's go. So I quit my job the next day. That's awesome, man. Literally, it was like, hey, uh, got to have a meeting. I met with the CEO, vice or er, president. And I was like, hey, I got to peace out. And they're like, well, wait, we like, there's no way you can do that. You know, you run all this stuff. I say, cool. Well, my consulting fee is ten thousand a month, and I, it's like I'm not going to be available. Like we can have a call maybe like once a week. I'm, it was like something very minimal. They were like, cool. Like literally, they're like, cool, no problem. I was like, damn. So, you know, they paid that for like six months. And then uh, they got the people they needed in all the places, gave me a warning. Like, it was, we have a good relationship. Well, during that time, I ended up um, building an oil and gas bot to be me. Right. So, like, instead of, so I was like, damn. So, whenever this does stop, I've got to have something reaching out yeah. to these people to keep income coming in so I don't just waste it. So I did that for all those six months. So now what the, the last six months have looked like is my assistant sends out a text message and a chat bot talks to thousands of oil and gas people and it brings in jobs. Wow. And we just, and now we just, um, we just charge a commission and it, it's very like not, I don't do like my assistant handles that. So That's they- awesome. They, yeah, so we still have that section of the business that we're able to obtain revenue from. Yeah. Well, yeah. dude, I think you just – like your story, you just achieved like the dream that most people have like when they go work for corporate America is like, hey, I put my time in and, and then I earn my seat at the table. And then from there, you be able to dictate your own terms of your worth because you've made yourself indispensable. So – I actually kind of want to rewind a little bit because, dude, I swear, every time I have someone on that shares, like, like, dude, there's tons of gold. They just gloss over that part. I go, like, oh, yeah. yeah, and I just, you know, uh, became president. <laughs> yeah. Gave the world, whatever, you know, next ch next chapter. So kind of break down that, that journey, brother, of, like, how you navigated throughout that company and what are some of the things that you did that separated yourself so that you were, like, literally, dude, like, most people never get in a spot where they can literally write their own ticket, much less even talk to their boss. 
the way that yeah. you did. But I know what it took for you to do that because you earned it. So I want to hear some of the gold nuggets of what you did to get yourself in that spot because I know people listening are going to be asking the same question. Yeah, man, we'll rewind. So when I started out driving a truck, you got to think I was hungry. Like yeah. I needed to make money. Like I needed air. Like I needed water, right? <laughs> so I was like, how many hours can I work? And they're like, as many as you want. I was like, cool, what's the pay? $10 an hour. I said, damn, $10 an hour, all I could work, we gonna make some money. So, uh, you know, that job's 24 seven. So I think the longest I ever stayed up was a week, right? Before I like finally just fell out. Wow. So first, uh, first six months um, in that business, that particular business, I was the trucks I was driving had the equipment that needed to be ran and that equipment would run like explosives and recovery tools and things like that to get things out of the earth that way yeah. oil and gas can happen you know whatever so those were the trucks I was driving well within the first six months I you know was out I was inside that cab watching and I was the person the grunt like giving the tools and doing that and you know, and then eventually they're like, hey, wire this, do that, do that. And then I just got back, you know, the best at everything I did because I worked more. That was it. I just worked more than everybody else. And then when I got the best at that, then I trained somebody to take my job at each thing I did. Mm. You know, I was like, man, maybe if I train this dude, then I can do this. And then if I train this dude, then I could do this or this gal or whatever. There was gals in that business. And then I was like, man, maybe I could be an engineer. Do I need a degree? They're like, no, you don't need one. You just, you got to be able to do the job. Most people do have a degree, but you don't, it's not required. I was like, cool. All right, well, let me run that. Just watch me. And then, so I did that. And then I started training people to run, run all the equipment. And then my boss, I was like, damn, this guy's like, I could do his job. So uh, <laughs> I was like, hey, bro, you need help? And uh, he's like, yeah, I need a lot of help. I was like, cool. I'm going to run everything. Just chill. So then, you know, I'd just be running all the jobs, scheduling, coordinating, had no clue what I was doing, no finance background, nothing. Uh, I remember making spreadsheets and like trying to track all the stuff, didn't even know what all that was. And then that dude moved up because I took his job. And I was like, well, damn, there's another wrong. And I told that dude, I was like, well, let me, let me learn this. So he was training me to do that. And then he just chilled. And uh, well, he was actually on the way out to peace out. He was going to open his own company and he told me and he's like, you're going to have to do this anyway. And I'm like, hell yeah. And that was a corporate position. And I was like, all right, cool. So I'm doing it. He leaves, you know, and then there's like another position that opened up. So I moved like two spots up. So now I'm like corporate manager of all this stuff. And, uh, you know, it just kind of went from there. I was, the, I did that for several years and then they're like, Hey, like we really want to keep you. Maybe you can own a part of this company too. And they're the uh, like billion dollar company, you know, yeah. I'm going to say their name. They didn't end up coming through on their promise on the ownership. They were trying to pay it out, which they were paying me a lot for it, but they didn't want to give away equity, which I didn't blame them. Right. But it was promised, but I could never get that out of my head. And something sparked. And I was like, man, like it never occurred to me ever, ever like on that journey until that moment, until I didn't get that equity. I was like, I was like, man, if I don't do something, I'm always just going to work for somebody. And I'm always yeah. going to be begging for this little amount of equity when, you know, I want more. I know I want more because my brain's telling me that. Yeah. You know? So that's how that journey went, man. Dude, I love it, man. There's there's so many just successful behaviors that you just shared. So, like, number one is outwork people. Like, we can control that, right? Yep. Number two was being able to replicate yourself. Yep. That's one thing I see a lot of people fail at is like they'll promote someone because they're like really good at the job, but they're not good at training and developing or leading other people. So then they get stunted. So, but you know, here you are out working people and then, all right, I can scale myself because obviously I'm training and developing. So then obviously anyone with common sense in any company is going to pluck that person yep. and pull them up. And then the third thing is you treated your boss like your client. Yep. What do exactly. you need, man? What That's do you it. what can I do to make your life easier? Yep. Versus the natural reaction is like, oh, it's my boss. I'm gonna 
you know, just do the bare minimum or I'm going to have a certain type of way. So, dude, I just think those, just that mindset can take you so far and everything. And, and to your point, I reached the same point too, brother. You know, I've grown my umpteenth company um, and reached the same thing. I'm like, if I'm going to work this hard and this long for essentially table scraps of the total pie, you know, why am I not just betting on myself and just going ahead and doing this for myself? So I I love that, man. I reached the same point in my career. So so let's do that with shift gears and and kind of go into the next part. So obviously you start off your entrepreneur career and dude, you've built some awesome things with your real estate and fitness. You know, I think what what I'd love to hear is like out of both those ventures, like what's been the biggest lesson you've you've learned so far in through in entrepreneurship? I think um I think with real estate numbers are inflated and it's mm. easy to like post all these checks and and I think it's cool because you need motivation. I think right. you need motivation. some people don't think you do. I think you need motivation mm. internal and external. But you know the biggest thing to learn in, in real estate and growing a company is you might get paid all this money, but it's still like any other business. There's still a margin. Right. And, and you eat last if you're, if you're a good operator yeah. and, and it's all about, you know, growing that, that margin and that ROI, you know, so I like to keep that in the front and center of people's minds. Cause what I, what I think, and there's two lessons. So I'll share the first one. What I think is a lot of people get discouraged when they do own a business. And because I talk to them and they're like, man, like we just made all this money, but I only got this, you know, and it's like, you know, you got to figure that out, you know, right. But it's going to come with time and it's just, it's just time. It's just implementation and time, you know, mm. and tweaking. And the other thing is marketing, you know, um, i never realized now I do at scale, how expensive marketing could be, right. To, to, because it has to keep growing. You can tweak it and get a better return on that marketing, but essentially you're going to spend more to make more a lot of times. I know that you, you know, you can go through old leads and things like that, but however, or another mistake that I've made in the past, I don't now. And I've seen other people make is they market, they throw some money at marketing off the, off the gate and they don't get a return right away and they stop yep. and they do it again. They get a little paycheck and they stop and they do it again. They're this vicious cycle, right? Instead of like, you got to be able to measure those KPIs. So it's got to be consistent marketing, whether that's, I don't care what the dollar amount is, but it's got to be a consistent, you know, and then revisit it and tweak instead of quitting because that scarcity comes in and it's like, Oh my God, I need money. Like I can't, I got to figure out another way. And it's just this vicious cycle, man. You know, it's funny, man. It's the same thing in fitness too. Yep. You know, yep. that same mentality that creeps into that dude, that scarcity mindset of like not being consistent with it. Because it's the same thing with exercise, dude. Like if you, yeah. you work out five days a week this week and then you don't work out at all next week, it doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I agree with you, dude. Consistency is key. And no matter what you do, especially with the marketing side of that, man, I think that's great. So so what are you, what's your prediction then with the market that we're in? So like, and, and to give a little bit of context, and, and obviously I think you should you can elaborate a little bit more. Is like, I know you do kind of um, uh, I don't like what, what's the proper term for this? Like the mobile home parks. I know yeah. you do a lot of deals out there and and different things like that. So I would love for you to kind of share like what's your insight in that industry and where you kind of see things going. Cause right now we're in uncertain times and obviously yeah. real estate is a very lucrative industry, but you, there's some things you need to know. So I would love to be able to pick your brain a little bit and have you kind of share your insights on that. Yeah, man. Um, first off, I think people shouldn't wait to if if real estate's their thing or they think it might be a thing they want to do. I don't think they should wait on the market because we can't ever yeah can't ever predict that stuff. You know, and I know I know about half the people I talk to say they're waiting on interest rates. Well, it's like you're going to be waiting on something else. Like you might wait on interest rates, but then you're going to wait on prices because what happens when interest rates go down? You know, prices shoot up. Then you're mm -hmm. like, well, I'm waiting on. You're always going to be waiting, 
right? Because it's going to be this or this. It's never going to be like exactly prime time. So as far as where I think the market's going to go is rates keep rising. And usually in any industry, in anything, that ACE doesn't get used till it's needed. Mm. The ACE being the interest rate. So like the economy's still doing like relatively okay, right? So when it's absolutely needed, I think it'll happen. Mm. You know, that's how I look at it. But just to be brutally honest, I don't even pay attention to it because I'm in every segment of real estate. I'm in the the cash buy, the retail, the buy and hold the flip. So like every part of the market always helps me. It just, it just depended on which one's going to help me better at the time. Right now, wholesaling seems to be picking up. Okay. So what's, what's wholesaling for our audience that maybe doesn't understand it, like understand that term necessarily? Yeah. So wholesaling is say that your neighbor had his house uh, or you heard your neighbor talking to him. Right. And he's like, man, I want to sell my house for a hundred thousand dollars. And you're like, man, these houses in the neighborhood are like $200,000. I was like, cool. Well, I'm going to go put that under contract. And what that looks like, and you tell them, you know, you're like, hey, look, this is what I'm going to do. I would like, and this is, you know, if you did want to purchase it or not, whatever, be honest. But hey, I might want to purchase your house. You know, I kind of like that price. These things are going for this amount. Let's do a purchase agreement. Cool. Y'all do a purchase agreement. I'm purchasing your house for $100,000. All right. Well, now you've got a buddy on the other side of you. I'm just trying to make it simple. You know, next, the other next door neighbor, and he's like, man, like my son was moving back from whatever, and, and we really would love him to be close to us. You know, I wish I could find a good deal in this neighborhood. You're like, you know what? Like, I've got this house under contract for 100000 You don't have to tell me the amount, but y'all are buddies. I've got it for 100000 Like, you know what? I'll sell you that contract. That You can have that house for 120000 how about that? And and your son could have a badass deal. Mm -hmm. And so what you would do is now you'd make an assignment contract and you'd have him sign that. All right. So that assignment would say, hey, I'm purchasing this one or two ways. It would say, hey, $20,000 assignment or I'm purchasing this house for $120,000 and blah, blah, blah. So now you your title company has the original or attorney. Some states do title companies. Some states do attorneys. Uh, but anyway, original contract assignment agreement. So now whenever this deal closes, they're going to take that $20,000 and they're going to get that to you, whether it be wire or check. And that is a wholesale deal. It's an assignment of contract that you did and yeah. you're going to get paid a fee for that. Yeah, man. Dude, it's badass. And just for y'all listening, um, I go to a lot of uh, Travis's events and Kai Logue and some of the other people is that space just because like I'm just fascinated with real estate is something that I wanted to like find out more and and get more into but uh the coolest thing about the event that Travis had uh, and we were just talking about this before we started the podcast was that they actually had like live closing on stage like people cold calling I wouldn't say necessarily cold cold leads but not exactly like scorching hot <laughs> to say but they were literally getting on stage and just as Travis was explaining, just having that conversation of taking off people's hands and then being able to sell it. It's uh it was one of the coolest experiences I ever had watching that dude. And it's like, yeah, I just made 20 grand and I don't know, 10 minute conversation. So yep. dude, I just think it's so cool what you do, man. It's like being a cowboy. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, man. You know, and I think on that stage they closed. Um, I, I saw at least two or three deals yeah, being closed they, within, I don't know, 30, 40 minutes. Yeah, they, like each, that. they each closed the deal. I know that for yeah. a fact. Yeah. So that's pretty cool. Yeah. So so let me ask you this, man. So obviously there's going to be some people that are interested in like actually getting into wholesaling and like conducting those deals. Um, what would be your advice for someone that's looking more of like a passive? role like more of a like hey i don't want to necessarily get in there and do all the work and manage and sell and all that but you know i'd like to be able to park my money somewhere and have it work for me what would you say to those people two things if it's if we're talking real estate mm -hmm. two things there's syndication funds out there 
good buddy of mine, Brandon Brittingham, has one. Uh, I don't get anything for saying that. I'm just he comes to mind. Um, what they do is they get investors to give them money. They find badass deals. They pay their investors a return. That's as hands off as it gets. Um, I also provide not a syndication, but for wholesaling business. Some people want to be a part of it. What we provide is JV partnerships. What that looks like is they, when I say they, it's the people that are interested in parking their money, say they got a few grand a month, whatever it is that they want to make a return on. What they do is they buy leads and we close them and we do a 60, 40 partnership with them. So now it's like a done for you wholesale business, or if they want to cherry pick deals that they want out of those, they can do that too. So basically they could have it so that they're, you're closing, like, for example, you close the wholesaling deal and they're getting 40% or are they getting yep. 60? They're getting they get 40 and you're getting 60. Yep. That's all. That's awesome. Everything. Man. Yeah. They just, and we don't even take the money. Like, I don't want to be in charge of their money. We recommend them to the marketing companies that we vouch for, that we agree, that we put our money with. Right. And we want to be successful too. So we want to make sure they're with a, a legitimate company. Right. REI completes one of them. Um, all right. REI print mail, you know, it's, it's a mailer service, but we have a company, you know, a construction company out in East Texas, you know, they put a few grand They're They don't actually spend a ton for all the leads they get, you know, they, they were really good, but you know, some people spend a lot, some people spend a little, but they spend a few grand a month and you know, we, we send them 40% of the deals, or I think they bought a few flips from us. You know, they cherry pick the ones they want to flip. Right. And they, it was funny about that. And what gave me that idea was I realized there's a lot of people that spend marketing money that don't get deals. And it's not because they're not qualified. They're not good. The deals aren't, leads aren't good. It's just as you know, in business, it takes a certain type of person for acquisitions. It takes a certain type of person to move deals. It takes a certain team. And I feel like we have the team to do that. So I started offering that service and it stuck like hotcakes because people were like, hell yeah, we've spent tens of thousands of dollars with no return. I said, give me those leads. You've already paid for them. Right. And I was 40%. We started closing them. And I was like, light bulb. You know, I was like, Dude, I'll that's take That's genius, five. man. So- yeah. So you created a chat bot for your last company to basically be you. You created a Jarvis, basically. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And now you're offering done for you closing wholesaling deals. Yeah. Hell yeah. That's insane, man. I love it. So let's do this. We're going to start working towards the, the back end of the segment, laying the plane and moving towards the rapid fire. But I do have one more. So We've talked a lot about mindset. We And once again, I think you've demonstrated more than talked about it just through your story of you know, where you came from, the working up in the oil and gas industry to obviously what you're doing in wholesaling. You know, what do you think like really keeps entrepreneurs stuck, man? Because like, once again, like I'm listening to you, man, and I'm getting fired up just listening to like, well, I went here and then I did this and then I did this and you know, we run into so many entrepreneurs, man, that like they'll end up spending like years in the same place in their business. And it seems like no matter what they do, they just can't seem to move the needle. What would be your insight for the, for that person right now that's just stuck and they're like, I'm just not sure how to get to that next step. Like, what do you think's holding that person back the most? I think it's like if you gave somebody a book that's never read before and told them to read it, Right. So I think you need a mentor or coach. It's mm. my, it's my, like, I don't know how you're going to read the book. If you never learned how to read, maybe you could go listen to something to teach you to read. And a year later, you might make some money or you could figure out how to hire the best people. I've taken out loans for coaches, right? Mm. I spent a lot of money on coaches. I think last year I spent $200,000 on coaches, probably do the same thing this year. Mm. You know, Did I, was I like, Oh my God, like how am I? Yeah. I was, but I'm like, I know that I need to learn how to read, yeah. right? So like, I need them to teach me. And if I want to be successful, I'm going to pick people that I align with. Like, like we got a vibe. It doesn't mean they're bad, good, nothing, but we got a vibe. Like I got to yeah. feel like to be my buddy. Like we could, you know, they're going to tell me how the cow eats the cabbage. Like they're going to be on my ass if I need it. They got to be the person. Yeah. And, and I think that is the number one. And, you know, I think most, most people don't pull the trigger on doing that because 
like I said, scarcity mindset. Figure it out. Like right. figure it all out. Find well, the best. Well, speaking of your boy Brandon, um, something he said to me, dude, that changed my life was don't hire for where you are, hire for where you're going. Yeah. Um, dude, that changed my life because at the time I was hiring for where I was, and and that's not just like team members and employees or contractors, that's mentors too. You know, hire a mentor for where you want to go. And sometimes that's a little bit more money than you're comfortable doing. I remember the first time I signed up, uh, it was Apex Executives. Dude, I thought I was going to throw up when I wired that money the first time. You know what I mean? (laughs) But I'm so grateful that I did because it changed my life. It builds tolerance too, right? Like, if anything... Right. Everybody thinks they're going to get all this crazy value of 100 percent of this coaching and everything you're going to just absorb. You're not. But one nugget, like one nugget and some tolerance build up will change. Yeah. Well, something else I, I figured out, too, man, was like, you don't just hire a mentor and go, OK, fix me and then sit right. back passively. Yep. It's going in with intention and going, what do I want to extract from this other human? that can make me better and mm-hmm. being intentional. Like, and I hear a lot of that with like, well, who I selected in the first place, I've already checked off yeah. all those boxes, but you know, I think even more so just even every conversation I have with the coach, I don't just show up passively. Like I'm showing up with intention on here's what I'm doing. Here's what I'm looking for. So that I actually give them something to work with, <laughs> with me. Exactly. Yeah, for sure. So I think that's number one. I think most people would, be more successful if they did that. Yep. Amen to that. All right, brother. So we're going to shift gears, move to the rapid fire. Um, once again, these are random, man. Some of these are heartfelt. Some of these are completely ridiculous. So you just have to say first thing that comes to the top of your head, uh, and we're going to have a little fun with it. So my first one is, did Diddy do it? <laughs> you know what's funny is I don't watch TV, and um, I don't even know what the hell – I know, I know about it, but I don't even know what the hell. I couldn't tell you anything about any of that. Like, literally, I haven't owned a TV. And, I mean, we have one, so I guess there's, like, Netflix every now and then, so I'm lying. But, like, I don't – literally, I'm not a TV. I just – I'm too wired up. So I couldn't answer that question because I got no idea scenario. <laughs> well, dude, for me, it just – like, so I watch YouTube. Like, I don't really watch a whole lot of TV, but, like, YouTube yeah. is, like, kind of my go-to. And just out of nowhere, it's, like – the algorithm came out and it's like all these <laughs> clips and I'm just like, what the hell's happening? So like it kind of the vortex and social media pulled me in. So now like I know all the stuff going on. So awesome. yeah. And uh, the answer to the question, he definitely did it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll save you some time, brother. Yeah. Um, <laughs> all right. Now, if you could be in any industry, regardless of credibility or experience like dude i think you could pick something completely ridiculous it's like dude i have no point being over here but i think it would be fun what yeah. industry would you get into still be real estate man oh know. come on man there's that one other that. one that would be like i mean i wouldn't know the first thing but i think it would be fun i know it's i know it's like a, a redundant thing you know but Man, I couldn't think of one other one I would want to be in other than real estate. I'm I'm being, yeah. you know, I'm just being completely honest. <laughs> well, I'll, so I'll share this. Me and my wife, uh, this is back when we were personal trainers at this gym called The Russian. We uh, we were assistants, and we took a week off to go to, on this cruise. And uh, when we went on the cruise, we actually saw that there was, like, personal trainers, like, like, on the cruise. Like, that was their job. So, like, we were joking, like, jokingly like hey what if we just like never came back to work and we just disappeared and became cruise personal trainers like (laughs) that's just who we are you know we just live on this boat and we work out all the all the overweight people when they eat the butt too much buffet food um yeah i would never do that i would lose my mind living on a boat but uh it was, yeah, a, it was a brief yeah. fantasy we had for a brief moment just to think. So anyway, I just thought I'd ask, man. I worked out on the water, man, and I get seasick to this day, so I can't do it. Bro, I did uh tried doing Bosu squats on yeah. a cruise ship. Yeah. That was, that was a terrible idea. <laughs> All right, man. Next one. Uh, best piece of advice for a young, hungry entrepreneur that's not hiring a mentor because you already gave that one away. 
So instead of hiring a mentor, go work for the best person in the industry. Oh. Period. I don't care if it's got to be for free. I don't care what you got to do. You know, I think you never want to change your story because the process is where we're made. And I think you should really be grateful of the process and the, and your journey. So the question you didn't ask this, but it, you know, it's just like, what would you have done different? I wouldn't have, but if, if I had to talk to a young me and I, and they wanted to get 10 years ahead quicker, I would say, I don't give a crap about money. I don't care where you live. I don't care what you do. Go work for free. I don't care about finding the best person, period, to go work for and what you want to do. Like you said, you had this thing where it's like, well, you wanted to be, you already a trainer. You want to recruit. What, what if that was it? Find the best person that runs that. And right. That's what they whatever. do and go, go study right. and learn from them. Yeah. 10 years. That shapes 10 years. Like yep. learning trips. Dude, I love it, man. Um, I can definitely think of a couple companies that have dramatically shifted like who I've become. And if I hadn't worked there, I wouldn't have learned the things that I learned. So no, that's yeah. great. That's awesome. Um, all right, next one. Fun fact that nobody knows about you. And I already gave y'all my my half uh You dig that that's a good of- one, man. That's gonna be a movie one day, but like What's the what's one odd quirk or something that nobody knows about you? Which make this an exclusive for real talk of real business pros. First time ever hearing this. Oh man, um, you know it's it's not too exciting, but I'm from uh, North Carolina and I'm I'm like I'm adopted. Like I don't know if I always say that, you know. I didn't know you were adopted. <laughs> yeah. Oh. So you know, dad was in prison for like eighteen years. You know, that happens. So uh, I don't know. I think plenty of people might know that, but it's just one of those like, hey, not things you hear every day. Yeah, I, I was looking for like uh, you did synchronized, synchronized swimming in middle school or something. But, you know, we'll go with the whole, uh, you know, you were adopted. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You're just hitting with the hammers on this one, man. All right. Yeah, dude. <laughs> All right, brother. All right. Here's my favorite question. We'll end the show on. Imagine you have a billboard. The whole world's going to see this. Every man, woman, and child is going to read this. What would it say and why? Oh, man. I guess keep going. Mm. Right? Like, my biggest pet peeve is when people quit. Anything. I don't care what it is. I don't care if it's fitness. Like, you're very well, you know how that is in that industry. I don't care if it's business. I don't care what it is. Like, I don't care. Like, don't stop. Because if you don't stop, you can't lose. Period. Right. Amen to that, brother. So with that being said, what's the best way for people to connect with you, follow you, do all the things? And then once again, for y'all listening, I'll make sure this is in the show notes so it's easy for you to click and find. Cool. So, um, yeah, if you want to find me, I'm most active on Facebook. You DM me. Might take me a few days to get to you, but I will, or it might be my assistant, but it will happen as me. And uh, Facebook, Travis Clay Wells, or Travis Wells, Instagrams, Travis Clay Wells. I have a lot of, I post a lot of real estate stuff there. Um, and yeah, man, that those are the best two ways to get, get with me. Awesome. Awesome. I love it, man. Just the old school, just drop me a line and I'll take care of you. So I'll drop those profile links inside the, uh, the show notes. And and once again, guys, I can vouch Travis. He he is who he says he is. You, you drop him a line. He he'll do anything he can within his power to help you. That's how him and I met. So with that being said, Travis, thank you so much, man, for taking time out of your day to sit, to share your time and your treasure um dude i just i get so much out of every time we have these talks and dude i i learned more about you today man i've known you for years so this has been a great show i appreciate you coming on yeah dude appreciate you having me you have a good rest of your day too yeah absolutely so for y'all tuning in make sure you go out there be like travis wells and go get what you worth baby yeah yeah And that's a wrap for this episode of Real Talk of Real Business Pros. Thank you so much for tuning in and being a part of this journey with us. We hope today's episode inspires you to take your career, relationships, and personal life to new heights. Don't forget to subscribe on your favorite podcast platform so you never miss an episode. Until next time, keep on getting what you're worth.